First, I would like to preface that this video isn't a review of Like a Dragon 8 Infinite Wealth, but instead the thoughts that I have after 300%ing the game and sank over 200 plus hours. I'm not suited to review games because I don't know what makes a game good or bad on a technical level. I just point out things that I like or dislike in a game, and see if these likes or dislike make or ruin the game experience for me as a whole. With that out of the way, welcome to my Like a Dragon 8 Infinite Wealth thoughts of the game. In this video, I'll be splitting into multiple sections, some may be longer than others, but I'll try to keep things brief as possible. The story of Infinite Wealth is good, but not the strongest entry. It's easy to follow along from beginning to end, nothing becomes confusing whatsoever. The overall message of the game does feel the same when it comes to Ichiban. It's almost a one for one recreation of Ichiban and Masato from 7, but this time nobody dies. By no means this is a bad message to have since it's what makes Ichiban who he is as a character. He never gives up and always tries to convince others to take the right path regardless of how many horrible things they have done to either Ichiban or someone close to Ichiban. While on the other hand for Kiryu, it was a good expansion of 7's passing the torch where Kiryu apologizing to everyone that he has inconveniently wronged whether he was the catalyst or someone he knew caused it. Even though it was weird that Kiryu was the one who fought Ebina when we found out a few chapters beforehand that Ebina could have been another offspring of Arakawa, it would have been cooler to see another fight between two brothers with two different upbringings and ideology. There were many amazing moments in the latter half of the story, such as the fight with Majima, Saejima, and Daigo. Then the finale, they were fighting alongside with us at the Millennium Tower for one last time. Another moment that I really enjoyed was the reveal of Kiryu's cancer scene. It was also one of the biggest plot points throughout the entire story, and it was great to see how Ichiban and also Tomizawa react to this news very early on to the game. The tension between Kiryu and Ichiban in that scene was great. It was very heartbreaking for Ichiban to see his mentor accept the fact that he has cancer and not trying to do anything about it because he has accepted fate at that point. It goes to show that there's times that Ichiban can't change the outcome every time. As a side note, I do like the fact that since the great disillusion from the previous game, we as the players thought we were doing the right thing, but in the beginning of Infinite Wealth, there was a huge impact of ex Yagata members trying to come out clean and turn the lives around. That is going to hold true for the ending of Infinite Wealth with the huge reveal of Nele Island and Pelicana's true intentions. What Bryce said at the end had some truth and could be foreshadowing the next game's impact. Alongside with the nuclear waste disposal, I think that another huge impact would come in the form of Ichiban's reputation. The fact that Chitose revealed that all of Tatara Hisoka's video were all scripted by AG to expose Ichiban and apologizing for it might be a double-edged sword. Some fans might take it positively and some might not. We will just need to see how it goes for Ichiban in the next game. The new party members, Tomizawa, Chitose, and to a certain degree, Songhee, were a great inclusion. Tomizawa's arc from a no-name crook with the Yamai Syndicate to a loyal member to Ichiban's crew was great to see. We see more of him explaining why he did the things he did, and the entire Drinkling story of Tomizawa was the closure he needed. I hope we can see him in the next game making a cameo appearance. As for Chitose, her arc was also amazing, from deceiving Ichiban, to the reveal that she's Tatara Hisoka, then to the next heir to the Fujinomiya group. Great to see a female lead that isn't romantically attracted to Ichiban, but instead attracted to his mindset and life. Although her karaoke songs seem to say the opposite. As for Songhee, it was good to see her out in the field alongside with Kiryu and company. Something I find funny to see is Songhee's scat moe towards Kiryu, where she sees him as a legend that she gets to tag along for his journey despite the history between Kiryu and the Jingguang Mafia. Moving on to the villain starting with Dwight, he was an interesting early boss to the Barracuda Syndicate. Then as the story started to unravel, we started to lose his charm over time because we had to fight him multiple times and the story treated him as the pawn than anything else because the Palakana is the real big bad for Ichiban's party. I will say that the introduction to the Barracudas is the best of the series thus far because of how ruthless they treat people if they came across them at the wrong place at the wrong time. It honestly felt like a genuine threat for Ichiban and Kiryu to overcome early on in the story. Yamai is definitely an anomaly of a character from his introduction at Heiji's motel to his final goodbye at the hospital. We do fight him multiple times, but instead of being a main threat like Palakana, Gangja, or the Barracudas, he's just lost and misguided. He simply wants to fit in and be somewhat important in Hawaii, trying to be a menace towards Ichiban. With his stoic demeanor, he's clearly made to be the opposite to Ichiban while trying to copy Kiryu's energy. Although he turns himself in at the end of the story, I hope we get to see him again in the next installment. Unfortunately, we have to talk about Wang To, the commander of the Gangjo. All I can say is that he doesn't do much, but gives us an exposition dump after his fight and gives us more details about who's really giving the orders to find Akane and Lani. The only good thing out of Wang To is his boss battle, 
and a key motivator for Kiryu because it is reminding him of how his journey first started with Haruka and Yumi back in Yakuza 1. Eiji is a typical archetype that pretends to be good until he's caught into act. I have nothing wrong with that trope being played out. I don't tend to really analyze a lot of the smaller details when I'm playing the game for the first time. I do think that Eiji did some real horrible things when we confronted him at the bar guilty. It really put a sour taste in my mouth that he was unsavable, even for Ichiban. As usual, Ichiban takes no for an answer and changes AG to turn himself in and allow him to reflect on the things he has done. Although he feels like a one and done type of character, I do think he should be in the next game to help spread the word for Ichiban's sake. This is what I said earlier in the video about Ichiban's reputation potentially being worse than the exposed video from Tatara. So I think with Eiji's skills as a journalist, he can lessen the blow by a bit. Rez on the other hand is a very typical villain that has a god complex. He pretends to do good because that's what Palakana is, but deep down, it's a facility for him to train and brainwash the kids to do his own bidding. Even with Bryce's first introduction, with the mural at the art wall, we already knew what type of character he's going to be. We as the players just needed to press his buttons to make him come out truthfully. He's not much of a threat because he's over 80 plus years old, although his boss fight was quite enjoyable. On to the Japan side of characters, we have Ebina and Sawashiro. Sawashiro felt like he was a wasted potential in the game due to the fact that he was great in 7. I do think that the most hard hitting fact that we learned is that he never killed Chairman Hoshino back in 7, but instead it was someone else that Masato hired. Along with Masato's comments towards Sawashiro, it made the impact so much more potent in the fight in 7. Sometimes I wish that the cutscene was in 7 and not in Infinite Wealth. All things considered, it makes sense that he was the one that knew all of the events of 7 and is an insider of the Seiju clan, so we can push the story along in the curious side of things. I just hope that he recovers from all the bruises that Ebina did to him and move on. As for Ebina, I think that he was an alright final villain for Infinite Wealth. I wish there was more time so we get to see Ebina and Ichiban interact and maybe have hints of Ebina having a slight distaste of Ichiban's outlook. Instead of the calm and collected facade he has throughout the entire game up until he breaks in front of Kiryu. I say this because we find out that Ebina is potentially a half-brother due to Arakawa's past conflict with the Hikawa family. At the ending, it said that Bryce and Ebina vanished, so one can assume that they were doing time respectively, as shown previously with Ichiban helping Eiji go into the Kamurocho police department. I just hope the next game we might have a scene with Ichiban and Ebina, just to have a small chat to see if Ebina is still the same person in jail or has changed after what Kiryu has said to him after he passes out. Because if Ichiban believes that Eiji can change for the better and wait for him for however long he needs to, I think Ichiban will do the same for Ebina. What can I say about the gameplay? RGD Studio has greatly improved on the combat mechanics by tenfolds. Not only did they allow you to move in combat, deal back attack bonus, and proximity bonus, but they also revamped the weapon upgrade system to make it more simple and streamlined. The jobs were all enjoyable, even though my entire playthrough I stuck to everyone's base jobs while using some of their other jobs' base skills through skill inheritance. I'll keep the jobs very brief here, but the jobs I really enjoyed were Kiryu's Dragon of Dojima and Tomizawa's Taxi Driver. I would like to talk about all the other classes in another video in depth, or else this section will overshadow all the other sections. The combat feels much more fast paced compared to the previous game, and now a lot more thought needs to go through to each battle to minimize the enemies spreading around. A small note that I realized that I don't think people have talked about is that the enemies now don't have an opportune attack like the previous game. I wish that the opportune attack for enemies stayed because it should demerit players for not moving as often in combat. This is something I had to overcome early on in the game because I was playing infinite wealth just like how I was playing Yakuza 7. For the boss battle, all of them had their own unique touch to it even though some of them boiled down to having healing skills or a massive AoE attack just to level the playing field. Personally, my favorite fights were Kiryu vs Majima, Saijima, and Daigo, and Ichiban vs Bryce and Palakano. For Kiryu's fight, I found it super unique on how you're supposed to defeat each of them through a scripted dragon's resurgence mode, so everyone was caught off guard when it happened. I do wish that the mid QT had a similar effect as Majima and Saijima fight from the previous game where it was a cool ass move that they did, but this time they included Daigo. As for Ichiban vs Bryce and Palakana, I really liked how it was a 3 phase fight instead of one big fight with mobs included, and had the same effect as Gaiden's Shishido boss fight, where the map changes so it becomes a new phase of the boss. It wouldn't be a real RPG if the boss doesn't have multiple phases. Another core element of Infinite Wealth is the fact that it is dual protagonist. At the beginning of chapter 8, we have Kiryu sent back to Japan with Namba as his right hand man. After some cutscenes, we are introduced to the bucket list and his awakening. This is the game telling us that we have some unfinished business left undone. Spread across Hijincho are some random spots where we have Kiryu look back at some core memories that he has done throughout the years. Alongside the bucket list, he has his own personality wheel that he is able to level up and improve his Dragon of Dojima job. I think this is a good addition for the game to really set in stone that this is Kiryu's last game. And we as the player should also look back at all 18 years of the game that Sega and RGG Studios has created. 
This is to hope that he will be sidelined forever and never become a main character of a mainline series ever again, as sad and harsh as it sounds. There are many quality of life changes in Infinite Wealth, the most notable one would be taking taxis throughout the map instead of your phone. Ichiban and company has access to a segue to use both in Hawaii and Yokohama to traverse the big maps, and the ability to perform a smackdown when your level is significantly higher than the enemies to reduce the battling of enemies. A huge change that I'm glad that RGG took their time to improve is the archive of the party talks, bond talk, and the table talk all in one. It's always good to have a system where we can look back on old talks just to remember some silly one-liner a party member has said, or realizing how the party can function due to the silly shenanigans they partake in. Another quality of life is that a lot of the enemies have crowns. They are a way to farm final base weapons and stat boosters at a consistent rate, unlike the previous game where the chance of finding boosters in a briefcase are quite low. So having this makes the grind for boosters much less RNG. There are some minigames that I quite enjoy a lot, and some I wish could be made replayable or fleshed out even more. There are also some that have great starting charm but slowly lose their novelty very fast. Starting with the ones that I enjoyed, there are undoubtedly Tsujimon Battle and Crazy Eats. Of course, the two favorite mini games have to be slight resemblance to games that we all know or have played. Sujimon Battle was fun and simple, it didn't need to be overly complicated and had a linear storyline to go along with it. Other than the positives, there aren't many negatives on the Sujimon Battles. All the aspects of it from battling to catching to raids feels very rewarding. Crazy Eats on the other hand is a can collection but for Hawaii. It's taking a simple idea from food delivery apps and another Sega IP to make it into a crazy minigame. Again, the minigame is very straightforward and not challenging at all. The only negatives about it would be to avoid all the obstacles as best you can because there are some runs where I barely scraped it for an S rank, but other than that, it's a very enjoyable minigame. Personally, I wish some of the minigames within the substories were replayable or fleshed out more. Something like the Anaconda Escape or the Car Dodging minigame. I do think that Anaconda Escape has the potential to be a 3 level minigame with varying difficulties. Since the questions are based on Anaconda Shopping Mall, the questions can get progressively harder to test if the players are paying attention to the shopping mall. Sadly, not all minigames are made equal. Starting with Mismatch. The idea of the minigame is understandable, and it's supposed to build upon Ichiban's lack of Riz. We're supposed to chat to girls online to get them to go on a first date with us. The catch here is that not all the girls we talk to are going to be successful. At first I enjoyed the first few losses until I actually got one of the winning girls. But after that it slowly became the same pattern just to see if we get catfished or not. At the end of the day, I liked the story behind the minigame, but the minigame itself was on the average side of things. Dontoko Island is one of the biggest minigame in Infinite Wealth. It is advertised to be one of the main selling points of the game. It has this Animal Crossing-esque gameplay where we collect materials and build furniture, buildings, and many other things to polish up the island. It's also the game's business management minigame where there's a whole entire story of its own. The goal of Dontoko Island is to remove trash from specific areas of the island so we can build stuff on it, which allows us to bring guests who stay at the resort. I think this is my fault, but I am usually really bad at managing, therefore I take much longer than I need to to reach for the next star. The gameplay loop is simple, but what kills it is the day-night cycle. We can't call it a day until it reaches nighttime, and the day-night cycle probably takes roughly 10 to 20 minutes. So most of the time, once I'm done with my daily task, I just sit and wait for the day to be over to make more progress than the next day. The story of Dontoko Island is fine. It's pretty much a run-of-the-mill story of a passionate guy wanting the island to be a 5-star resort, but there is an evil group of people throwing the trash at the island. At the end of the journey, we get a new QI move, but it's just an orbital laser reskin with Dontoko Island members. I was hoping that it could be something entirely different. I haven't talked about the returning minigames because they are pretty much the same across the Dragon Engine games, like Shogi, Mahjong, Baseball, Karaoke, Blackjack, Poker, Golf, and many more. While they are the same and have stayed untouched, RGG added a small feature that wasn't in 7. It is the ability to play these minigames with your party members. Why get your ass kicked oh. by random voices when you can get your ass kicked by your party members? I think this is a great feature just because if you want to play a random minigame to chill, you have the option. On top of the minigames, the arcade games are back with some new games to play. They were all enjoyable, especially Sega Bass Fishing. Virtua Fighter 3 was definitely interesting making it a 3v3, which at first might take a long time, but there's an input to make it back to 1v1 which is nice. The last one was Spike Out. This took a while for me to enjoy, but as I got the hang of how the game worked, I enjoyed it. I still sucked the game, which made it a pay to win experience. I later learned that the person who created Spike Out was none other than Toshihiro Nagoshi, which was a surprise for me. Once I knew the fact, I paid more attention to the enemies and I realized some of the movesets were used for some of the Yakuza games. It was good to see the building blocks for the Yakuza game within an arcade. In this last section, we'll talk about miscellaneous topics that didn't really fit in the previous categories. 
Starting things off with sub-stories. As usual, the sub-stories are all great, ranging from heartwarming to bizarre situations. Personally, I like number 24 just because of how heartwarming the sub-story was and have a great message behind it. It's what makes the Yakuza series as a whole very powerful because it's always about the human drama elements between people. The biggest hurdle with the sub-stories tying into the main story is that some of them introduces new mechanics into the game that are core elements of the turn-based nature. For example, the introduction of Julie's gear workshop for weapons or Aloha Happy Tours for the job change. While those are important. There are some that were mandatory but fell out of place. I'm pretty sure you guys know where I'm going with this one. This does ruin the flow of the story a lot, especially chapter 6 with the introduction of Dondoko Island. I don't mind the sub-stories getting in the way of the main story unless they're trying to introduce a new mechanic into the game. An example would be the previous game Yakuza 7 with the business management game. After the tutorial and a bit of the sub-story, we can immediately leave and continue with the main story. Again, this might not be an issue for first-time playthroughs, but for those who speedrun the game or casually doing New Game Plus playthroughs, they will have to do the mandatory Dondoko Island no matter what. This is just unnecessary padding to make the game feel longer than it should be. They could have just written the intro of Dondoko Island sub story to be similar to the business management of 7 where it's a short tutorial and then we can leave immediately. Moving on, the original soundtrack of the game is once again amazing. From the mob fights to the long battle, the music department always knocks it out of the park. My personal favorites were...
karaoke, I have two tracks that I love the most, which are Honolulu City Lights and If I Could Love The One I Love. It's great to hear Han Joong-hee sing because he was the only member from the previous game that didn't have a song. So I'm glad he was given the opportunity to sing this time. One gripe I had with the karaoke tracklist is that not all of Kiryu's greatest hits are available. We do have some classics like Bakamitai and Machine Gun Kiss. But songs like Kamurcho Lullaby, E.G. Sakura 2000, Today is Diamond aren't in the game. Even within songs like Sayonara Silent Night or Shin Itizu Samurai would be nice to have. Imagine a duet of Pure Love Kamurocho with Songhee. She'll probably drop that on the spot if it actually happened. It's a bummer that Kiryu's last game we can't have all his songs in one game, even though canonically he loves karaoke. Lastly, one of the biggest topics that led up to the release of Infinite Wealth was the fact that New Game Plus was locked behind paywall. It also included the post-game content called The Big Swell, where we get to have several short stories of the entire party enjoying Hawaii to the fullest. Personally, I liked all the party stories that they have written because that's what I loved about Seven and Infinite Wealth. But the gameplay aspect of it is pretty boring because it introduces another dungeon to play through. The only reason for people to purchase the DLC pack is if they want to have a full party of max character levels and all max job levels. Other than that, the post game is pretty much nothing. I totally understand why people were upset about this and so was I when it was first talked about in the community. At the same time, I'm also the problem because I bought it. I just hope this is not going to be a trend for the series because I love this series and everyone else does too. I don't want this beloved series that just got its recognition in the west to just drop off because of some shady business practices. At the end of the day, with the pros and cons of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, I still had a great time with the game. It's always great to play a mainline game with Ichiban and his crew because I love the chemistry with all the party members whether it's tied to the main story or party chats. They all feel like real people and that's what I think RGG has done amazingly. I can't wait for what they have store in the future, but whatever they do, I'll gladly enjoy it in my own way. This is definitely a longer video than the previous one. I hope you guys enjoyed my thoughts about the game even though it's been 2 months since the game has been launched. If there's anything that I've missed, please be sure to comment down below. I do have more videos planned for the future, but other than that, thanks for watching. Peace.